Secret of the Indian, Chapter 13, Mr. Johnson Smells a Rat. Mr. Johnson. We're talking about school again. We're talking about Omri School. Mr. Johnson was the headmaster. Do you remember that? Next day was Monday school. Omri got up very early after a restless night. Little Bear didn't have to wake him for once. The first thing he did was open the chest. Patrick was exactly as before, chill-flushed but breathing shallowly. Omri crouched on his heels, staring at him. He knew what he should do. What he must do, really. Anyway, he was dying to hear what had been happening in Texas, if indeed that was where Patrick had wound up. It was just that Omri didn't want to interrupt a great adventure if there was one going on. Nevertheless, he closed the lid and put his hand on the key with its red satin ribbon. Young man, I need some assistance. It was Matron in her most commanding mood. Could it wait, Matron? No, some of these men are so much better they can go back where they belong. They're just taking up beds, not to mention my time. Come along, I've marshaled them outside that cupboard of yours. Now get them on their way. Omri stood up. The Indians, about nine of them, many with bandaged limbs or heads, one with, on crutches made of matchsticks, stood near the door of the cupboard. Little Bear and Bright Stars were with them. Is it okay if they go back, Little Bear? Good go back. In village, much need do. Each brave have work, enough for many. You want to go back with them? said Omri with a heavy heart. Little Bear looked up at him. I think much of go back or stay. I wish this and this. So I choose. You send Little Bear back now. Then when sun go, you bring here again. I see village, then come back, see hurt braves. Well, that's a great idea. You could almost be in two places at once. Will you take Bright Stars with you? Yes, take wife, take son. I'm bring Little Bear back when sun go. Ami felt a bit confused about the logistics of all this, but he nodded and he and Little Bear touched hands. He opened the cupboard, and with some help from Matron and each other, the Indians scrambled over the bottom rim. Little Bear helped Bright Stars in, and she cast a tender look back at Omri and waved at him. Omri then borrowed the key from the chest and dispatched them. Why did he feel sad about this parting when it was to only be for a day? He took the plastic figure from the cupboard and put them safely in his pocket. Matron gave a sigh of satisfaction. We're not going to lose any more now, she said. The others are all on the men. What did the team think of it all? Matron permitted herself a smirk. Well, as the bard say, Pontius does make cowards of us all. I think each of them thought he probably had had too much to drink, and none of them liked to admit it to the others, so they just got on with the job as per my orders, I mean suggestions. I suppose you were up all night after we sent them back. Let's just say I didn't get a lot of sleep. Never mind, all in a night's work. You're wonderful, said Omri, sincerely. Oh, pish, tushin, likewise, poo, said Matron, dismissing the compliment. But he'd seen a blush of pleasure spread over those craggy features. What about a cup of tea? Can't start the day without my tea. And I can't start mine without my coffee, chimed in Boone's voice. Amory had fixed him up a little house made of Legos and put it out of sight behind the cupboard so Boone could get a good night's sleep away from the seed tray with all the hospital-like hustle and bustle. So now Amory lifted the roof off and Boone was sitting bolt upright in bed looking ready for anything. I'm more than a mite hungry, too, since I didn't get my liquor. Don't go on forgetting I need some powerful vittles. Omri had had trouble with him the night before when he returned without any whiskey. Remember what happened with Omri's dad. He hurried down to the kitchen and fetched as many powerful vittles as he could readily lay hands on while boiling the kettle for tea and coffee. He wished Emma were here. He felt beleaguered having to do everything himself. He wasn't sure he'd gotten his priorities right, seeing that everyone was fed before he did everything, anything about Patrick. As he tiptoed back upstairs, he thought he'd see to that as soon as he was dressed. But hardly was he back in his room than he was alarmed to hear footsteps rattling up the attic stairs. Hey, Omri, wake up. You're on the news. It was Gillen banging on his door, and Omri hastily heaped some junk on the top of the chest and opened the bedroom door a crack. What are you talking about? It was on my clock radio, Radio London. They just announced the winners of the story competition. Omri was speechless. He'd forgotten about winning the prize. Oh, I wish I'd heard it, he said at last. Too bad, it's over now, said Gillen, thumping down the stairs again in his pajamas. And after that, there just wasn't a minute's peace. His parents had both heard the announcement and were clamoring for Omri to come down for a special bacon and eggs breakfast to celebrate. And by the time that was done with, it was too late to go back upstairs because his train wouldn't wait for him. And luckily, he'd given the food to Matron to distribute, reserving a special, large, so to speak, portion for Boone in his little house. Omri just had to go off and leave Patrick wherever he was. So Patrick is still in that chest. Patrick's still in the chest, back in Boone's time, with Ruby Lou, I guess. Ah, crazy. And now Omri has to go to school. There were no skinheads to make trouble in Havel Road, and Omri had got to school in good order, although feeling highly uneasy. He was dead worried about Patrick. 
What would Patrick's mother say when he didn't show up? And what if he was in some kind of appalling danger as Omri himself had been in the Indian village and was waiting on tenterhooks to be brought back? Omri put his books and stuff in the locker room and then went to the assembly. Remember, every morning at the school, they meet in the gym, basically, or the uh, auditorium, I don't know which they have. And they have, an, they have a meeting with their headmaster before they start school. That's every day. So kind of like you would meet in the gym and all talk to Mrs. Ingstrom or let her talk before we got back to class. We don't do it that way. Um, Ami put his books and stuff there. So Mr. Johnson was already on the stage clearing his throat for silence. More than a usual number of teachers were there, too. Several hundred children were seated on the floor. Ami crept in and sat down near the main door. He craned his neck looking for Emma, but he couldn't see her. Hadn't she come to school? Hmm. He was still looking for her anxiously when Mr. Johnson began to talk. Ami didn't take in what he said until suddenly, with a shock, he heard the headmaster say his own name. Everywhere in the auditorium, people turned their heads to look at him, and Ami sat up straight and alarmed. Very proud indeed, Mr. Johnson concluded. Ami, stand up and come forward. Utterly bewildered, Ami stood and rose to his feet. Me? Yeah, yeah, said Mr. Johnson. All the teachers on the stage were smiling, and as Omri moved forward, everyone started to applaud. So imagine you're not paying attention in a meeting, and all of a sudden somebody says your name, and you've got to get up and start going to the front to the headmaster. Omri found himself being helped onto the stage, and turning, he saw that he was the focus of hundreds of pairs of eyes. What was all this? If only he'd just been listening. Now it just so happens, said Mr. Johnson, in unfamiliarly genial tones, that I have here a copy of Omri's story, which had to be kept by the school when Ami entered it for the competition. And what I thought would be really nice is if Ami agreed to read us this prize-winning story at this morning's assembly. So the principal, the headmaster, has heard that Ami won this prize, and they had a copy of that story, and so he now has to read the story in front of the whole school. Ami's mouth fell open. Mr. Johnson was handing him a typed manuscript, which he well recognized. He typed it himself, Hunt and Peck, just him in three copies. One he'd sent into telecom for the writing competition, one he'd kept, and this one he'd had to hand into the school office. And across the top was typed the, t the title, The Plastic Indian. He clutched it till it creased, swallowed hard, and looked up at Mr. Johnson imploringly. Now, now, Omri, no false modesty. Telecom has notified the school that you won first prize in the intermediate age group, $300. What about that, you people? And there was an impressed and envious gasp from the assembled crowd below, and Omri heard murmurs of, 300 bucks, wow! Get old Omri, that millionaire time, blimey. And they all burst into applause again. Stand here in the middle of the stage, Mr. Johnson said, maneuvering Omri by the shoulders. Now then, I haven't had a chance to read this myself, so I'm just going to sit here and enjoy it. Well done, Omri, off you go. So Omri dithered for a moment or two, and then, and then he thought, well, hey, this isn't half bad. I've dreamed of this happening. So he began to read his story. The story was based on his first meeting with the Indian a year ago when he first discovered the cupboard and the key's magic, and it was a great story, and he'd done his best to write it well. And at first, when he began to read it, he was nervous, and he stumbled over the words, but after a paragraph or two, he hit a stride and began to read with feeling and expression, and he did Little Bear's gruff voice and had a stab at Boone's Texas accent, and when he said something funny, the whole auditorium erupted with laughter. And during the exciting bits, everyone sat poised to catch what came next. It was very satisfying, and when he finished the story and the applause broke out again with some cheering, Ami felt this was a great moment in his life, one that he'd always remember. In fact, he was feeling extremely pleased with himself, not at all a sensation he was accustomed to at school, when he suddenly became aware that Mr. Johnson had stood up behind him and was looming over in a distinctively sinister manner. And before the applause died away, Mr. Johnson bent down, and whispered something in Omri's ear that made his blood chill in his veins. I want to see you in the office immediately. Omri turned to look at him. He was appalled to see that the geniality had been wiped from the headmaster's face, which had gone the color of a wet sheet. That story, said the grim voice of the hissing undertone, was supposed to be an invention. I have reason to believe that most of it, incredible as it seems, may be true. Why would the headmaster say that? Did he see the Indian and the cowboy? Oh, yeah. Remember when Patrick showed him? Mm. I think at the time he thought he was just going crazy. But now he's heard the story. Mm. Now we're back in um, Ruby Lou's time. Doc Brandt put his old-fashioned stethoscope back in his bag in silence. Patrick peeped through the frill of cotton lace around the top of Ruby Lou's dress and saw Boone lying on her bed on a bright-colored patchwork quilt. At least it wasn't lying out in the hot desert sand anymore, although 
It had not been so hot by the time they had finally found him. It had been getting dark, and Patrick had been scared they would never find him at all. The horse had been pretty useless. It became quite clear early on that it didn't have a clue where it left Lou. But Ruby Lou had been absolutely determined to find him. And luckily, Tickle's many and varied talents included amateur tracking, and with his help, they had finally found a place where the horse's tracks had rejoined the main trail into town, and this had made it very possible by the fact that the horse was wearing some very unusual horseshoes. Well, remember, the horse, that horse, was brought from a different time. It was one of Mommy's other plastic toys, so it probably didn't look very normal. It looks like horseshoes from a bygone age, said Tickle. After that, they had just been a matter of following them, and when they had lost them on the hard ground, Patrick had noticed silhouetted against a magnificent desert sunset, a tall cactus sticking up out of the horizon that he recognized. And soon after that, Ruby Lou and Tickle were heaving Boone's unconscious body onto the back of Tickle's wagon. So the horse and, and Patrick were able to find um, Boone's body. Sure must have had a crack in the head or something, said Tick. He's been out colder than last week's beans. Doc Brandt said nothing about last week's beans. He was just a man of few words. He packed his stethoscope away and said he was going to leave. Well, Doc, said Ruby Lou anxiously. The old man shook his head. I can't find nothing wrong with him. His head's okay. He ain't got a fever. He ain't been shot. Nothing but a bit of bruising on the ribs, maybe from when he fell off the horse. Seems like he just plumb don't want to wake up. Well, pardon me, Doc, but maybe he had too much alcohol, said Tickle. Look who's talking, said Ruby. The doctor shook his head. No, no liquor on his breath. We can't explain it. We just better leave him lay. When he'd gone, Tickle said he'd mosey over to the saloon to tickle the ivories for a while to soothe his nerves. Are you going to be okay in here alone, Ruby? I ain't alone, she said promptly, and she patted her bosom where Patrick was. Pat and me will keep each other company and decide what to do about Millie here. So again, Boone's body, big body, is in his time, right, with Ruby Lou, but his spirit and who he is are back with Omri, right, at three inches tall. Tickle suddenly grew himself to a full height of five feet and intoned an unexpected, deep, and commanding voice. Don't you go believe in everything you see. There's a lot of devil's work in this world. I know it, account I don't. I'm not free of sin myself. You hear that, said Ruby Lou to Patrick. There's a bit of preacher left in him, even though he ain't had a service since the Dead Eye Gang went through and burned the church down in 81. That's how he learned how to track, trying to chase him. As she spoke, Ruby lifted Patrick out between finger and thumb and put him on a table. The table was covered with rich and, from Patrick's point of view, colossal assortments of feminine fancies a tortoise-shelled back hairbrush, elaborate bottles of perfume, a number of sepia-tinted photos in heavily worked frames, an ivory comb. Patrick could have easily sunk and suffocated in the scented powder in the cut glass bowl and the mirror and the bright enamel frame from which he could just see his head was the size of a reflecting skyscraper. The copper hairpins scattered about were as tall as himself. Okay, Pat, let's hear from you, said Ruby. Who, me? said Patrick, startled. Don't you string me no line now. You know what's up with my pal Billy Boone, don't you? It was not a question. Her blue eyes were narrowed as she looked at him, although her wide red mouth was smiling knowingly. Patrick sat down cross-legged on a white swan's down powder puff. Yeah, I do as a matter of fact, but you're not going to believe me if I tell you. Try me, she said. So real quick, this is where Patrick is standing. So you can see him, and you see all kinds of things, you know, perfumes and powders and all kinds of things he's sitting on. Um, her bedside table, and you can see him standing. Well, Patrick said, Boone's left his body behind and gone into the future. There was a pause while she took this in. Supposing I say I believe you, and I just might, because he told me such a tale once himself. Will he come back? Yeah, but only if my friend Omri turns the key at the other end. Into the future, huh? Is that where you come from? Yep. What year, she asked, like maybe she would catch him out. He told her. Holy snake, she said. That's over a hundred years from now. She walked around the room for a bit, and Patrick watched her, and of course she was rather gaudily dressed, and he supposed she was a lady in name only, so to speak, but when she was at the far side of the room, he could see all of her, and it was obvious that she was very pretty. She was clever, too. Cleverer than all those crazy men at the bar who had startled, started shooting and fighting at the sight of him. And she was brave, too, and tough. The way she'd ridden that horse, the way she'd stuck to the search, the way she'd lifted Boone's big body onto the tail of the wagon. Patrick admired her. And she liked Boone. She liked him a lot. Patrick wondered if he liked her. She stopped pacing. 
what's it like in the future? Well, it's okay, said Patrick. I mean, we got a lot of gadgets and stuff for making life easier. You get about in cars. That's like horseless carriages, very fast. And we've got flying machines, and we've got moving photographs that you can have in your home for, to entertain you. And doctors have found out how to cure lots of diseases so people live longer. Great. That sounds great. Any bad things? Any drawbacks? She was clever. Well, yeah, there are too many people, really, and that makes a lot of mess, and plenty of them are poor and starving, and there's still crime, and there's lots of wars, and not just with guns and bows and arrows and stuff. There's weapons now. I mean, then, I mean, where I come from. Well, anyway, there's weapons that are much scarier. They could blow up the whole world. Ruby Lou strolled back to him and sat down, and she put her elbow on the table near him. Her arm was like a great white mar marble pillar and rested her chin on, his, on her hand, and she fixed her blue eyes on him. That's quite a drawback. All right, I guess I'll stick here to my time. It gets rough, all right, but at least we're too civilized to kill more than one or two at once. Say, they ain't going to shoot any of those bombs off while Billy's there, are they? I don't suppose so. They better not blow up my Billy, she said. And the way she, showed, she, she said it showed Patrick that she didn't just like Ruby. What does that mean? Maybe she loved him. Patrick spent the night cozily in the pocket of the raccoon skin jacket of Ruby Lou, which she laid out on a chair for him, and she spent the night sitting by the bed watching Boone. Won't you be tired, said Patrick, as she bedded him down after giving him a supper of a few fibers of underdone steak and a crumb of potato washed down with milk from her sewing thimble. Don't you fret about me, pal. I'm used to going without sleep. She turned the oil lamp low so as not to disturb him, and he he saw her move to the window, and she drew back the frilly curtain. Hmm, she said. The sky's a funny color. And she peered out into the night. And I don't like the feeling of the air, neither. Kind of tight feeling. I hope we ain't in for a big blow. A big blow? It's not like a tornado? Are we reading two books right now that have to do with tornadoes? Yep. <laughs> Patrick slept peacefully. In the morning, he woke with the fur tickle in his nose to all the noises of the town. Horses neighing, wheels rattling, dogs barking, roosters crowing, people's voices. But behind and around all of this was something odd and eerie, a sort of a whining, gusting sound. Ruby was standing where he had last seen her at the window, and Patrick sat up in the fur and sneezed. Ruby, he called as loudly as he could. She turned from the window and stooped and lifted him, and her hand was soft except for some calluses as big as watermelon, which must have come from riding horses. It smelled sweetly of soap, and it was trembling. How's Boone? Just the same, she said, but come here and look at the sky. She carried him to the window, and he rested his arms along the top of her curled finger and looked up. The sky, and indeed the air, was a strange yellowish color. Below the window, he could see the giant people hurrying about. The gusting sound was wind coming in irregular bursts. It caught at the women's dresses and pushed them along, and it blew smoke from chimneys away in sudden puffs like warning smoke signals. It was disturbing the horses, tearing at their manes, flattening their tails and their haunches, making them shake their heads uneasily. And as Patrick watched, the man's big hat was blown off his head and trundled up the dirt street along with several balls of thistles. And the man ran after it, and somewhere a door banged and banged rhythmically as the wind began to blow more steadily. What is it, Ruby? I'm not sure, partner. I, I just hope it ain't what I think it might be. What? Feels like it's blown up for a twister. Patrick turned to look at her, but all he could see was the underside of her chin, and his mouth had gone suddenly dry. Y you don't be mean a cyclone? A tornado? One of those black funnel things that... Ruby, looked, Ruby Lou looked at Boone lying on the bed. She covered him with a rug the night before, and he looked peaceful and had a good color, but he was still out. His hat, which Ruby had picked up on Patrick's advice, lay beside him. Say that'd be one for the book, she said with a sudden laugh. What would? We was worrying about what might happen to him there in your time, but what if your friend turned your magic key and sent Boone back to here and the bit of him he left behind here had been blowed clean away? Oh boy, the twister's coming down in Texas.